So as we say here, hello, everybody, everyone. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, how to finance innovations that can change the world. This is the topic of Hello Tomorrow. And uh, I would like to just present the subject before you speak, uh, each of you, uh, to present uh, yourself and to explain uh, what you do in this area. So I think the, the topic of this panel is about deep techs. What is deep techs? It's disruptive innovations that can change the world, like internet, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. So you, you will try to explain us what is deep tech and how to create a financial ecosystem around this goal. It means how could, to convince investors, we have uh, many investors and VCs here, how to convince investors to take long-term risk in order to help this disruption to come to the market. So it's a major goal, and we will discuss also about the public and private cooperation in this area. In particular, uh, the, uh, we, are, we will have an attention to the state inter intervention. This is the reason why we have BPI funds. And André is going to speak about an initiative. You will tell us what is the JEDI initiative in this uh, subject. So uh, as I said to everybody, my preference is to start before to present yourself on the subject, what is your views about deep text, what is deep text in your views, and uh, we are going to start with Mathieu. Mathieu is a partner at Airbus Ventures. Uh, Airbus Ventures is a venture capital arm of Airbus Group, Airbus Group of course, uh, very well known, and uh, you are going to explain us uh, what you do at Airbus Ventures. You have least than five minutes if you can. Sure. Uh, so, hello, thanks for having me here. Um, so, Airbus Venture is an early stage uh, VC arm uh, with a single LP, which is Airbus. We have 150 million under management. We are headquartered in the US, in the Silicon Valley, and operate also in Europe, Israel, and in Japan. We write checks uh, and support companies that are either seed or Series A. Uh, and then uh, from there, we help them interact with our ecosystem, we open doors, obviously try to open Airbus doors, uh, but also the one of the, let's say, entire uh, aerospace ecosystem. The, uh, the way we operate is, is usually not leading round. Uh, we just take minority stakes in the companies. Uh, and always try to uh, obviously operate in the interest of those, uh, those portfolio companies. In terms of sectors, we focus on aerospace markets, but also on adjacent markets, including areas uh, such as uh, autonomy, where we would be interested in uh, sensors, sensor fusion, algorithms, AI, uh, things like that. We are also interested in the electrification of the uh, aircraft, uh, so batteries, uh, battery management systems. We're looking at deals in uh, anything related to manufacturing that could be digital design and manufacturing, also predictive maintenance, industrial IoT. Uh, these are, are the kind of, uh, of project we are also uh, supporting. And um, connectivity, materials are part of the investment thesis too, uh, cyber as well. Uh, so I think I probably have all of them. So as you can see, many of them could be considered in some cases as uh, deep tech, uh, depending on how you define deep tech. Uh, I don't know if we will discuss this definition a bit later, but... Uh, could, could you tell us your definition of deep tech? To, to yeah, for us, so it's going to be uh, essentially things where uh, it's usually protected. Uh, there's um, there's a obviously a scientific or technology component in there, and it's usually hard to reproduce. Uh, very often, people tend to say that it's also disruptive, but to be perfectly honest, I, I don't like the term. Uh, I usually refer to Christensen for the uh, definition of disruptive innovation. And disruptive innovation, according to that, uh, that definition, is usually referring to, to technologies that start at the bottom of the market. So usually cheap uh, and not really delivering on expectation. And then they gradually move upstream 
and finally hit a moment where they are good enough and displace the uh, legacy players. And so I think that in many cases, when we think about deep depth, we're not really uh, talking about cheap solutions or things like that. So this is the reason why I'm not, not always like happy not when I hear with that, yeah. this, uh, <laughs> this disruptive term used here and there and sounds like a, a buzzword. Among the, the companies we've been invested in, so there's, there's roughly 15 of them today in the portfolio. We've been operating since a year and a half, nearly two years now. Uh, we have things such as uh, satellite constellation uh, from machine to machine, company called Astrocast. We also have uh, semiconductor players that are uh, addressing uh, battery, uh, let's say, power management system for uh, energy harvesting, company, a Belgium company called EPs, uh, and so on and so on. So a couple of them would be, would be considered deep tech. We also have, for example, made an investment in QCWare that is a, um, a company uh, focusing on, on software stack for uh, quantum computers. So we okay. would consider these, uh, these deep techs. Okay, thank you, Mathieu. Uh, Evgenia Plotnikova, who is investor at Atomico. You are a VC, as we say, venture capitalist. <laughs> and uh, you are based in London. And uh, you working on uh, sourcing, evalu evaluating uh, new investments like uh, deep techs, I imagine. Can you just present uh, what uh, Atomico is and uh, maybe tell us what you think uh, are the next disruptive companies you could invest in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance. I actually took my, phone, uh, my notes on my phone, so I promise I'm not on Instagram or Facebook. Um, they're actually my stats. So um, my name is Evgenia. I work for Atomico. Atomico is a venture capital firm based in London. Uh, we were created 11 years ago by Nicholas Zanstrom, who is a co-founder of Skype. So we've existed for 11 years now. Uh, we're investing now at our fourth fund, which is $765 million, which is fairly large for Europe. And that's because we believe in the European ecosystem. And we think that the next multi-billion dollar companies will, will be um, created in, in Europe. So to date, we, we made um, roughly 80 investments in companies like Supercell, uh, Rovio, Klarna, and, and some of the others. And um, frankly, I think one thing to keep in mind is with, with such a large fund, you need to make big and bold bets. And so historically, we've invested in companies that are not only disrupting the current business models, but also creating entirely new markets um, and taking on the, the entire industries. So I think to give some of, um, some of the examples where you know, we think that uh, there is an opportunity for sustainable development, right? so uh, Im improving uh, the life of humanity while, while making a return and while caring, caring for the environment is things like transportation. So we're investors in, in, in Lilium, uh, which is the vertical takeoff uh, in lending jet. We're investors in OnTruck, which is a B2B freight marketplace. Uh, we're also investors in OFO, which is a Chinese bike sharing platform. We also invest in food production. So recently we've announced an investment in Memphis Meats, which is uh, an artificial meat producing company uh, out of the US. We're also investors in, in FarmDrop, and FarmDrop tackles the food production and, and supply chain. And we touch upon any um, other sort of big and, and exciting sectors where we can focus on, on the sustainable uh, development angle. Some of them are education, where we're investors in Newton. Uh, others are healthcare with, with, Hinge, with Hinge Health, for example. So, uh, yes, absolutely, we, we do believe that, uh, you know, someone like ourselves, like a venture capital firm, can foster investments and disrupt some of those big sectors. Uh, and we have definitely been proving that with, with our portfolio. Um, in terms of uh, how, do, how do we invest and, and kind of why now and what, why in Europe, I think there are a few things to mention. So, A, first of all, we think that now is, is the age of entrepreneur. Uh, so today, entrepreneurs, and not just the governments, uh, are taking on some of, some of the largest bets um, in history. Um, if you look in um, 2006, the five top listed companies, only one of them was a technology company, which was Microsoft. If you look today, sort of 10, 11 years later, all five of them are technology companies, right? So Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, and Facebook have been added to the ranks. So clearly, 
technology is the biggest value driver, and this is why we think venture capital-backed companies will be creating uh, enormous value. We also think that uh, entrepreneurs today have the largest toolkit at their disposal to drive their change. So, you know, in um, the last 24 months, we've added more uh, computing power than in the entire history of humanity. In the next five years, we'll have 30 billion connected devices, which means technology will permeate every single thing we do, whether it's brushing your teeth, getting into the car, or taking out an insurance policy. So this, this will have a tremendous, uh, tremendous effect, and this will allow the entrepreneurs to disrupt things in a, in a new and significant way. Um, now, those bigger problems, we also think, will create bigger returns. Um, so if you look at just one example of Tesla, 45% of oil consumption is driven by cars today, right? And when uh, Elon Musk came out with electric vehicle, no one thought that would be scalable or this will affect entire industries. Now, if you look at it today, I think it fundamentally changed the entire car industry. Um, and all major manufacturers today and governments are, are tackling the, prob the problem in, in a new um, and different way. Um, and I know, we'll, you know, I know we'll be speaking as to Europe maybe versus the US or versus, uh, uh, versus other industries. So we are firm believers that European market will create the next multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, we think that um, in Europe today you have more developers per each VC-backed company. You, we create uh, two times more STEM graduates than, than in the US. Our developers are twice as loyal and cost us half the money. So there, there's clearly an opportunity in Europe to provide the right and ripe ecosystem to create sort of the, the, the next big disruptors of, of tomorrow. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to, to this later because you are, you are six people to speak, <laughs> sorry. Uh, am I, uh, am I uh, Parta Sarati? You are the scientific director of the Thiel Foundation, very well-known Peter Thiel. Uh, entrepreneur, and you founded uh, Breakout Labs. So maybe you can present what is Breakout Labs and how it, it can contribute to finance some uh, radical technologies. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, we started Breakout Labs in 2011 out of the Teal Foundation, and the rationale was really that the time was right for uh, scientific innovation, for, for translation of great scientific discovery into companies that can really make an impact on society, but that there was this uh, gap in support and funding at the very earliest stages of uh, spinning out these companies. So we started Breakout Labs as both a fund and a program within the foundation. We fund eight to 10 companies a year, and when we look at deep tech, what we're really looking for is a fundamental scientific advance at the heart of a company uh, that is creating a platform technology. And the companies we fund are going after a particular commercialization hypothesis. So we will fund up to $350,000 for them to achieve a prototype, a proof of concept, that we and they believe will be a significant de-risking step for them to get further investment from um, more market rate investors. So we're putting actual philanthropic dollars into these companies as effectors of change in society. Uh, and so to date, we have funded 39 companies, I believe, and they range from uh, biofabrication of leather, speaking to the earlier um, materials companies that we heard from today. Uh, Modern Meadow is a company that's uh, basically uh, brewing collagen to create new kinds of leather. Uh, we have companies, uh, Positron Dynamics, which is uh, trying to use antimatter uh, space propulsion tech, or to, to, to produce space propulsion technologies. Uh, so we have companies that aim high, but one of the key characteristics of them is that they are uh, going after a near-term application where they can gain some traction in the marketplace. Thank you. Uh, now we have two people from the banking sector. One is from the private sector. Sophia Merlo from BNP Paribas Wealth Management, and the second one is Paul Francois Fournier from the public sector. We'll speak just before with Sophia. So, could you tell us what you do uh, with uh, BNP Paribas Wealth Management? We imagine you are a lot of investors who are very wealthy. So, how can they invest? Uh, do they uh, invest in uh, uh, deep techs or inno innovation uh, like uh, we discussed uh, just before? And what is the role of a bank like BNP Paribas in this uh, revolution? Okay, so first, good afternoon to everyone. Yes, I'm co-heading the wealth management uh, 
sector of BNP Paribas, which is uh, number seven in the world, 355 uh, uh, billion of euros of asset management gathering from our clients, so in uh, Europe, Asia, and the United States. Uh, but of course, we are part of an integrated group as BNP Paribas, you know, in different countries. And I think that the bank, uh, Pride Bank, is, is a part of the ecosystem. And we're here, of course, uh, with uh, three main axes for companies and, of course, for startups. The first one is to support them, to help them uh, find the financing, find the equity. We have some partnership with BPI for that. We have also uh, a company, the BNP Paribas Development, who has uh, committed to invest 50 million euros in startups on a long-term basis, different kind of sectors. This is the first axis. The second one is that we work with startups to help our own business to change. Uh, the different businesses of the bank are working with startups from blockchain with the custodians, or even in the wealth management, we have since two years now works on minimum viable products in the factories that we have implemented in Asia, in Europe, trying to work with our clients with our people, with the startups, to develop something that will be helpful in the way the clients would like to consume the bank for the future. So this is how we are transforming ourselves. The third thing is how we could connect our clients and the startups. And we know that for that, we could help the startups having links with our corporate clients or also with our wealthy clients. So we have different kind of programs in Europe or also in the United States to meet the startups and to, of course, make some uh, business between those clients just by themselves. And I would say that last but not least, because I want just to, to stress on this, uh, we also work uh, more on the women. Uh, part of the uh, entrepreneurs and I'm very glad that there are two here. It's not usual and uh, I think that we need to work on that because we are we do not have sufficient uh, women uh, Working on the entrepreneurs part just 35 percent of women are business owners and when you look at the fintechs We are just at seven percent. So we have something we think at the banking level to help women grow faster, helping them find equity, find financing, be less cautious. So this is my special act. Thank you, man. That's a good remark to say that this is uh, very, the parity is uh, respected. And I'm not here, or I am a woman inside, as you know. So, uh, Paul Francois Fournier, uh, you are from the public sector, a very well known bank, BPI France which was created uh, five, six years ago, and it's a great success. But uh, you are the director of the innovation uh, area, so what do you do today to help uh, innovation and deep tech innovation to emerge in France? So we, um, we finance innovation very quickly. We, uh, we finance um, uh, in-depth uh, startups and SMEs on their innovation project. We uh, invest directly yeah. through direct VC fund. We co-invest in startup, on, on and we uh, invest in fund of fund in uh, in VC fund. Almost 100 VC fund that that we finance in France, uh, and that's the different levers uh, we use to uh, uh, to support the French uh, uh, innovation ecosystem. See, if we if we um, take two step back, maybe uh, let's say for us there are two things which are improving. And there are two things with, which, which need to, to improve in the coming years. The things which are improving is first, uh, the first one is that we are together creating an ecosystem where most of the young people are thinking about creating their startup. It was not the case five years ago. It's no reality. The last poll are 50% of the young in between 18 and 25 years ago, uh, 25 years are thinking about creating their startup. If we take the figures of uh, uh, BPI France as uh, financing startups. We were financing 1,500 1, startups in 013. We will probably finance more than 4,000 uh, startups this year. So you see that this is really booming, and, and we think that's a very, uh, a very good move. The second uh, uh, thing which is improving is the VC ecosystem to uh, help those companies to grow up. 
uh, this uh, VC ecosystem was, was I would say, uh, there were numerous VC funds in France. There are still numerous. There are almost 200 VC funds, but they were too small. Uh, and, and then they were not able to support the fact that sometimes to create a worldwide leader, you need 10, 20, 100, maybe at a time a billion euro of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of um, investment. Um, and we uh, uh, make huge effort with the ecosystem to increase the, the size of the VC fund. To give you one figure, the, 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 the average size of a VC fund we were financing in 2013 was 80 million euro. The average size of the VC fund we, we, were, we have financed in the last year was 160 million euro, even 180. So it's doubling. And the, the, the VC industry has doubled or tripled in the last past, uh, past uh, three years. We feel that within one or two years, we will be the leading ecosystem in the VC industry in Europe. Um, UK is not in very good shape, to be direct. Uh, the UK VC ecosystem is almost stable. Uh, so we think that that's, that's a, good, uh, a good traction. So we need to, of course, it's, it's not perfect. It needs to improve. It needs to grow up. Uh, uh, there are many things to be done, but, but we, feel, we feel that's, that's a, a good traction. Uh, maybe to, to, to see where we need to improve and, and to transform this ecosystem, the first uh, uh, axis is, uh, uh, is clearly on the deep tech uh, and on the tech transfer. Uh, this ecosystem is, is improving, but there is still a lot of disconnection in between the university, the technology, uh, 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 schools, uh, uh, um, uh, all this world where we have a lot of IP, but, but the, the, the entrepreneur ecosystem and even the VC ecosystem is not connected enough to this, uh, to this ecosystem. So there is lots to be done there. And, and, uh, and it's clearly something we need to improve. Uh, let's say the VC are not very keen sometimes when they are not very expert to invest in deep tech because it's very hard, it's very complex. You need to, uh, to make a lot of selection, uh, uh, but it's, it's very uh, uh, important and can create a lot of value. So that's clearly something we, we need to, uh, uh, to, to look at and, and see whether as BPI France, as an ecosystem we can, we can improve and there are probably a lot of initiatives we can look at, at, at that. Uh, I think there is a good understanding uh, nowadays that this is clearly something we need to, to improve in the next four or five years, so that's something we can, we can leverage. The second thing we need to improve is the connection with the large corporate. We create an ecosystem where there are many, many startups, that's good. But let's say that an ecosystem which is wealthy is an ecosystem where there are much more exit than we, are in, in, we have in France and in Europe. So we need to see how we can uh, help support the fact that large corporate look at uh, acquiring startup as a way of making innovation, like it's done in the, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, Google is acquiring 70 startups each uh, 18 months. Uh, the SBF 120 is acquiring 40 startups in, in, in 18 months. So uh, uh, the way uh, um, uh, the CAC 40, the uh, big corporate will leverage in Europe, even though in the US, this ecosystem is absolutely critical. If not, the ecosystem will no longer continue because we need the money to come back to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, the investors. And that's clearly something we need to, to, uh, to change in the, coming, uh, in the coming years. Thank you. It is, uh, of course, an important subject that we'll, we'll discuss also. And uh, last, uh, André, André Loscruc Pietri, who is a Chief Jedi Officer and also an investor, former investor, former special advisor to the French Ministry of Finance, as I said. What is your view, André, about uh, what we discussed uh, together? And what do you think is the role of the state in uh, this, this special case? Because we, we all have in mind the DARPA. Uh, DARPA was uh, created, I think, just before, after the Sputnik launch by uh, USSR. And the uh, Americans had, had, had a fear to, to, be, uh, 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 to, to be in a competition in space and decided to invest and to create this special uh, uh, fund which is a state-owned fund. So uh, one of your ideas is to create a European DARPA 
And is it possible? Is it, is, can we imagine to create that? And how, how, to do, how to do it? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So I think the one disruptive thing that Sophia mentioned about the panel being very uh, 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 equilibrated, but what I never saw is a panel where the women squeeze the man on the sofa. So I think that's also very interesting. So it's pretty narrow here, so uh, I try to express as best. So um, good afternoon. I mean, just the understanding of deep tech, because that was your question to, to all of the panelists. Our understanding of disruptive innovation, to take that name, is basically that you see that disruptive innovation has been a massive way of creating future economic growth. So when you look at how uh, disruptions, innovations are actually integrating after three, five, ten years into the economy, but also, as you mentioned, for a country, it's also a way to preserve a certain way of sovereignty, of independence. So this is really the, the understanding. And uh, my, my second point is about the role of the state. Um, when you look at the U.S., there's a big myth about the fact that the U.S. is driven only by uh, uh, private entrepreneurs and, and free capitalism. When you look at the role that, uh, that the United States government, and especially the Department of Defense, not necessarily because it's defense, but because it's one of the few ministries that has a very long-term uh, approach, because it has a multi-year uh, uh, budgeting process, the capacity they had to, uh, to instigate key innovations. So probably for most of you, it's well known that internet, something as key as the internet, was initially called DARPANET. And so it's a creation of this, uh, this agency that you mentioned. The GPS, uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk is using rockets which have been developed through a NASA DARPA uh, program. Uh, neural uh, networks. Um, autonomous driving. For those of you who have an iPhone in their pocket, Siri was initially a Stanford Research Institute, SRI, project financed by DARPA. So DARPA has been everywhere. And when you look at the East, if you look at China, you see that today it's authoritarian states, like China, who have this privilege of thinking long term. So it's, it's very important, I think, for us uh, in France, in Europe, to be able to take these bets that are not over five years, which is the role of the VCs, but the bets that nobody is taking today. And let's face it, nobody is really investing, despite everything you can see in pictures and so on, over five or ten years. Simply because neither corporates nor VCs, maybe a few uh, large fa family foundations, but even them, is really investing in massively breakthrough innovation because simply the risk level is too high to be, to be, to be financed. So this is what we want to do. So uh, the good news on the project is that uh, pr the project started a couple of weeks ago. The idea of creating a European DARPA is not new. Um, but the characteristic here is, number one, that it will not be focused on defense. So JEDI is... is uh, is an acronym for Joint European, so it's a European initiative, disruptive, D for disruptive, and initiative, because, and that's something I want to stress here with the ecosystem, is it should not and it should never be a bureaucracy. So we don't want to call it an agency, we don't want to call it a, a bank, we don't want to call it an institution. We will try to make JEDI something which is very agile, that means taking decisions in days and weeks and certainly not months, which is taking risk levels where you could theoretically lose everything, really pushing the envelope. Three, it's demanding money, so it's grants. It's purely grants, so JEDI is going to finance startups, large companies, and research institutes. Uh, JEDI is going to have priorities, so the idea is not to um, uh, put money everywhere, but probably to have 10 or 15 themes per year where challenges are going to uh, be um, given to the, to the ecosystem and people are going to pitch for that. And the idea is to be able to get between 2 and 50 million euro, this is the amount, uh, for research projects over a period of three months. That is going to be the decision process. And last but not least, the idea is to be completely focused on prototyping. So the idea is not like a lot of research is done 
uh, with the finality of doing a research paper. But the idea is to make a prototype that works. Why? Because the whole point is then to create products or, 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 um, or, or, or services which can then be invested by the seed financing, the VC, the late stage ecosystem. So last but not least, so this, this project has been endorsed by uh, the French president, for those of you who listened to his speech on Europe end of September, so three weeks ago. Um, we will start it on the French-German level for a very simple reason, not for a political reason. It's, of course, a nice political symbol, but because we believe scale is at the, uh, uh, at the, at the source of everything when we talk technology. And uh, secondly, obviously, because we believe we need to put a lot of uh, resources into that. And uh, probably one country like France or Germany alone uh, it will, not, will not be enough. And our objective is that it's going to be up and running early 2018. So we hope to work with a lot of you on, on, on that concept. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. So now we are going to start the discussion. So I have a few questions for you. The first one is uh, about time is money. Maybe we could start with Evgenia. Uh, never, it has never happened in the world, in the history, that we have so much money in the world. There is a lot of money. There is uh, money for retirement, the so sovereign funds, there is the money that the central banks are giving to the market. So uh, if you look at the uh, saving in the world, it's something like $150 trillion. So it's a lot of money. How is it possible, or maybe it is one of your, your job, to transform all this money, to take long-term risk, and to, to, to try to, to, to have uh, uh, yields? Because the second part of the story is that we never had so low interest rates in the world. So how to uh, have uh, good returns for investors, even for public, uh, who have their retirements in funds. Uh, if you, go, if you, you put that in the government bonds, it's not very good. You have uh, zero to one percent. So how to, to manage this? What is your view as a, someone who is working in the city? You know? <laughs> if I had an easy answer, I think I'd, um, I'd already be somewhere in my yacht. Um, Listen, it's obviously a challenge, right? And if you look at the amount of money that's been raised from you know, large VC funds, large private equity funds who are also going down the scale of the investing into growth, you look at the Vision Fund from SoftBank, I mean, obviously there is a lot of money that's flushing in the ecosystem and everyone is chasing yield, right? Like the rates at historical lows. Now, obviously it makes our job very challenging, but where I would maybe uh, disagree with uh, Andre is you know, we are looking at bets that can make it big and not necessarily every investment is a five-year horizon one, right? So obviously for a fund as large as ours, there will be software investments where we hope to exit in five years' time. There will be marketplaces which will hope to scale quickly and exit quickly as well. But there will also be bets where we will be very conscious that this is the kind of bet that can return the entire fund, but which will also be a longer route uh, to be to, to, to the exit, right? And, and those are the kind of deep tech bats that we're talking about, right? So obviously what, what that means is that we have to get into companies earlier. We have to start speaking to them sometimes way before we're able to invest and support the ecosystem. Maybe I, I could ask this question also to Sofia. That is an easy question, but I, I could add a question for you. As you know, the French government uh, has made a very important decision. The ESF, the Impost sur la Fortune, is going to disappear. So this year, all the wealthy people in France will have gave money to the state. They're not very happy to do that. Next year, they will not. They will have this money for them. How can you discuss with them to take some risk to finance and to have better yields than in OAT, for example? Well, this is already a question for all our wealthy people in, in the world where uh, uh, risk is linked also to uh, some more performance. So I think that the wealthy people like first to be diversified in their portfolios. Who are, we are there for, for that. And of course, uh, in the spectrum, they could like to have some uh, good return. 
and then we will see the private equity and the VC. And so we have, of course, a long, uh, large offer with private equity or with business angels to make this uh, uh, wealthy people be uh, connected. We have some events like the middle startups to make them connected with startups. This is on, on this level. And I would say that uh, on another, another level of the spectrum, um, we, we see that uh, our clients want also to be sure that where they are investing, uh, are impacting uh, in the right way the society. So, and we see this evolution very clearly. So, uh, even if they are investing in funds or if they are investing in terms of philanthropy. And in terms of philanthropy, I would say this is per, per, certainly the way where they will invest on the long term. And on this long term, they will probably look at those uh, uh, disruptive things that will help go forward on, uh, I would say, health or education or environment. So there we could find, of course, some uh, starters who will work on that, on uh, research, development, on neuroscientists or whatever, because they will find here something that will speak to them and that they will be on the long term. And they, for that, they are not waiting for a return, but they are waiting for an impact on the society. Maybe I could ask this question to Paul Francois, because uh, BPI France has launched a lot of uh, funds, uh, but uh, not very, very uh, easy for uh, people like me, for example, to invest in your funds, of course. So it's for professionals or uh, for VC. Uh, as we know, we have uh, 1.2 trillion euros in uh, what we call in France assurance vie. So it's not very translating, translated in English, but. Uh, Everybody knows it is a savings, the main saving uh, uh, in, in France. Uh, it's for everybody. I think there is a 60 million uh, assurance vie uh, in, uh, in France. So everybody has one. Is it possible that you could launch a, a, um, a fund that could di diversify the money that people give today? essentially to government bonds, so they give back to the state the money the state is t taking to them. <laughs> uh, uh, could you learn something that could be new and give access to uh, um, this kind of investments and give money to startups that can't, as you said, uh, have money uh, when you look, well, you're looking for 10 million francs, 10 million euros in, in France, it's already uh, impossible. I, I don't believe raising 10 million euros in France is, uh, is, uh, is today a problem. When you look at the numbers of... Uh, okay, uh, 15. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's probably no, the next stage is 100 million euros. We got it on a quarterly basis. So probably we need to, to, uh, to increase that. But, but the 10 million euros, uh, 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 we, we, we get an ecosystem which make it not easy because raising money is not complex. But your question is a very important one, which, which is... Uh, uh, we have now a uh, much more wealthy VC ecosystem. Uh, uh, and clearly, uh, if we want to double it again in the next two or three years, uh, which is the, the current uh, trend, uh, clearly there needs to be much more private money. That's clearly one of the main issues. And, and that's why uh, um, we, I think there, there needs to... Uh, to transfer some of the money, uh, which is nowadays in a much more long-term uh, uh, product, uh, financial product, to this, this ecosystem. The good news is that uh, this ecosystem is now creating a lot of money. I think for the bank and for the insurance, putting some money in the VC industry was, to be frank, uh, high risk, low reward in the past, I would say, five years. Nowadays, when you look to the result of the main and the best and the average VC fund, they are nowadays much more interesting than the, the money that you can raise to the BCE uh, easily and to other financial products. So, so there is a, a probably, and we hope that as this ecosystem is wealthy, the money will come to ease uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, ambition of doubling. The second lever we have to, uh, to, uh, to open is... is uh, the fact that our ecosystem, when you look at the Israeli ecosystem, for example, is only with French money, with public money, with a lot of private money also, but they are coming from the French bank, the French insurance. I would say probably 5% is coming from international. It's very low compared to what we see in London, what you see in Israel. Why? 
because, uh, let's say, some LPs were afraid of investing in French VC funds. I think things are changing, and we know I was in London a few days ago. Nicola was yesterday with some of the main investors which were in a meeting at l'Elysée. There is a big change. We need to uh, 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 um, help those uh, uh, LPs to come to invest in the French VC fund. They will bring money, but they will also sometimes bring expertise, bring mandate that will help to transform it. Uh, uh, and that's, that's clearly something that needs to, to, to improve in the, in, the coming, in the coming years. There's an alternative to what I said, is uh, what uh, Emma is doing, is uh, the philanth philanthropy uh, money, is what you, you try to do. Uh, do you think it is some, something that could grow? Uh, in the US it is cultural, in France it's not exactly uh, cultural, but it's growing also. Uh, can you tell us about that? Because uh, the advantage of philanthropy is that these people have time. Yeah, I think there's a, a, there's a very dynamic funding ecosystem right now in early stage science, which cuts across philanthropy and investing. And so what we're seeing certainly is, is people, high net worth individuals that are both interested in, in seeding these companies and understand that the equity clock, it might be premature to start it ticking at a certain point because a lot of these things take a long time. So, but at the same time, they, um, they're also very savvy financial people and, and want to see themselves making money while others are making money too. So I think we're seeing a lot of different kinds of vehicles emerging, starting with you know, just philanthropy going towards kind of these impact um, investment causes, things that people really, really care about, whether it's curing cancer or saving the environment. Uh, and then you're seeing what we did, for example, with Breakout Labs, where we um, give grants, but it's a hybrid vehicle where if the companies then go on to raise equity, our grant is actually exchanged for uh, equity in the company as well, so at a, at a discount. So um, you'll see that, and then you'll see all the way through to this kind of um, uh, investing in, in areas where uh, there can be deep scientific impact. So I think you see the same individuals uh, both using philanthropy and, and using investment in creative ways to, to spur deep technologies. Uh, so I think it's actually quite a, uh, an interesting time. Uh, combine that with the kinds of government grants and support and market pull that you can get you're starting to see ways in which investors can make money by investing in deep science, where that deep science is able to leverage philanthropy, leverage uh, government support, leverage, co leverage corporate pull. So certainly when we raised Breakout Ventures, which is a fund that it, we just closed this last year, uh, we did it in a relatively short time. It's a small fund, it's $60 million to invest in companies coming out of Breakout Labs. But all of the, um, the, the high net worth individuals that were RRLPs were equally sort of interested in getting exposure to new markets. Uh, getting into deep science companies that may not be as sort of frothy as the tech space is right now, so seeing real value creation, but also having that um, desire to make the world a better place. Sophia, maybe we could have your view about philanthropy in France. Yeah. Is it a, a growing market? I guess, if yeah, I, could say. I, I think, well, we have a, a lot of service <coughs> on that, and, and of course, uh, Philanthropy is a growing market. I think it's a growing market because probably culturally uh, in French people are not saying that they are philanthropists, but there are many. And in an entrepreneurs, we have a lot of entrepreneurs who are selling the company probably earlier than before. And now they are really, and we see that for now 10 years, they are really when they recover for other companies, they just take a part of the money for philanthropy. And there they are really looking at what, where they're investing like an entrepreneur. So they will invest in, in different causes, uh, probably with some technical part in it, but not always. But then they will look at it like entrepreneurs with some KPIs that let them understand that there is a real impact and that uh, the, their causes will, will go forward after that. Coming back to what you said on the life insurance companies uh, in France, because it's, of course, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, things that we have uh, to do there. We have recently launched with our private banking and the uh, uh, insurance company that we have, Cardiff, uh, a new private equity fund that will be invested in known quoted companies in different sector. So probably not really startups, but probably some companies that are already in the path of growing because we know that that will help also 
uh, growing companies. In France, we have a lot of startups, and then we have companies that are growing, and we, we need them to be growing faster. So the, the, the issue in France is to make those companies grow faster and become more, more big, bigger than, uh, than the, uh, that they are used to be. So this is where we, we will help um, the economy and the ecosystem. Thank you. Mathieu, maybe to speak about the corporate side and the, what you do, I think that your fund is $150 million, if I uh, understand. What are the limits of the corporate investments in this kind of uh, disruptive uh, uh, startups? And how do, you, how do you manage the relation with the startups? How do you take risk with them? How do you collaborate with uh, these uh, uh, companies? I mean, with regard to Airbus Venture, it's going to be the same as with any other uh, financially driven fund. We have some kind of a hybrid model, and so our governance, I would say, is very close to what you could find uh, with financial investor. Uh, but obviously, we also have this big group behind us, and so depending on the maturity of the company and depending on the risk, obviously, there will be uh, different ways to engage with the uh, I mean, with the startup and different ways for the startup to engage with the group. And so um, I really like what you said at the very beginning, saying that, okay, those companies are going after uh, very long-term bets, but you're also helping them or looking for companies that are trying to de-risk that by uh, finding a way to uh, sell something slightly earlier, even if it's not the ultimate goal, and that's a very good way to demonstrate that there's a, some kind of a product market fit uh, earlier than uh, what you're, you're trying to achieve. Because if the first test is in 15 years, like, it's going to be really hard to convince someone to invest. And this, uh, this DARPA model is, is one way to potentially help those startup through grants, through uh, pilot projects or whatever you call that, to actually demonstrate that they can make the first step or the second step and they risk uh, the, the project so that maybe VCs or corporate will feel more comfortable making an investment and, and, and supporting those projects because they've been de-risked the, that way. Andre, you wanted to... Yeah, no, I, ju I just wanted to react on that. I, I completely agree. I mean, look at the number, let's face it. Uh, today, the adoption rate of large corporates in Europe of innovation compared to the US is extremely low. I mean, we, for those who are entrepreneurs in the room, we all have made dozens of POCs, and, and, but going into real business, recurring re revenues takes ages. And then you see a lot of, you even have VCs in Europe who are structured in saying for this kind of, uh, of deep tech, we are only going to invest if there is a US uh, company who is going to be the first client. So I think that is a fundamental thing, and unfortunately, this is going to take a long time because this is going to take a lot of... I mean, that's what you mentioned about the exits, uh, the, the way of doing innovation. Uh, it, it's still not in the boardrooms. I mean, you have a lot of boardrooms of these, you know, 60-year-old men who are thinking innovation, and now they're saying, oh, we need to have an accelerator or a, a corporate venture fund. Not all of them are structuring it like you do. Uh, so we see that at the bottom of the pyramid, not on the big bets that where you can invest 10 or 20, but I think on, 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 on the, 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 the massively disruptive, very, very risky, very early stage technology today, you have kind of a valley where if you really want to make it big, I see so many small research teams who are, you know, uh, who are spending 50% of their time doing bureaucratic work to get uh, European or French or German and nobody is really responsible. Bureaucratic work to get research grants. These guys, they need a push. The problem is, for too long, the state has decided and some bureaucrats said, okay, we need to invest in this and this and this. What we need is to find a way where the industry, the ecosystem, gets money from the state because I don't think you should have any return on investment. Because if you have a return on investment mentality, number, number one, you're competing with the funds, and I think that's bad. Everybody should do exactly what he, he uh, should focus on. And secondly, you are going to be biased to the slightly less risky projects, which is great. But if you really want to change the game, to change the world, as the, as the American often say, then you, you, you probably need to be ready to lose all that money. 
coming back to the European DARPA, what is the next step? How to, f how to fund the money? Who is going to give the money? Germany, because they have a lot of money. Uh, uh, what is the impact on the budget uh, ratio? You know, it's we terrible. have the Maastricht Treaty, so we can't do anything. Uh, how to cooperate also with the, if I understand you, it is uh, something that is coming around the defense industry. So are going to cooperate with Airbus, with Thales, with uh, uh, France is not bad in this uh, industry of defense. So I mean, uh, I mean, uh, how, how does it work? I mean, the, ang work? the angle we took is, is obviously DARPA was purely defense. Uh, and uh, here in this case, we're going to do that slightly different. For us, the D is disruptive. So we are going to look at themes. Uh, obviously, the headlines are the ones we all know, AI, cyber, biotech, energy storage. But we, we see today that thinking about military or civil application makes less and less sense. i give you an example. Drones was a purely military topic 10, 10 years ago. Today, we see that most of the application will probably be in e-commerce, be in agriculture. I mean, there was a panel just before on that. If you take on the other side, video games today, uh, massively uh, multiplayer games, are today much more advanced on simulating a complex battlefield than things which have been developed by military research agencies. So you see that today, the link, uh, thinking about military or civil does not make any sense. So, Today, yeah, the main issue is that our state has no money, clearly. Money is not everything. I, I hope I, I could get the message across that agility, capacity of taking risks, speed is as important, and independence from political uh, influence is, is critical. But of course, we will need to have money, and uh, it will probably come partly from uh, the French state will, will, um, will sell off some of uh, strategic stakes uh, in the next coming months. But everybody is fighting for that pot of money, right? BPI is also fighting for it. Um, uh, defense, uh, obviously, will, uh, should be involved. And uh, you also have something which is called the Programme d'Investissement d'Avenir. What we see as French, and I should not say that, I hope there are no Germans in the, in the room, but obviously the German state has much more financial resources. But I think the opportunity for the French is that the ecosystem of deep tech of everything which is going on in the AI space, in the cyberspace, there is clearly an advance. The challenge that we see, I mean, you all know uh, Facebook uh, AI research, 120 people, 40 French. People we trained, people we schooled, and people who are making Mark Zuckerberg even richer. Paul François Fournier, um, Emmanuel Macron, I think he has understood what you say. Uh, he spoke a lot about innovation during his campaign. He wants to launch, he's going to launch a 10 billion euro fund that could be managed by BPI France. We don't know yet, but uh, it will be funded by privatization and so on. So he understood what, what is the subject. I think he is okay for the, Europe, the idea of uh, what André said, the European DARPA, even if uh, nobody knows how to, to do it. So, uh, do you think that France has taken the, the good view about uh, the uh, challenges we are facing we are between the US, as we said, and, the, and China? We have a very competitive industry, but uh, maybe it will not be the case in 20 years if we don't do just now. If we don't put a lot of money in uh, these different disruptive uh, industries. Yes, you, you, I mean, we can, we can compare with US and China, but at the French level, um, I don't think that's the right answer. And I think when... when so the good level said, is a European uh, one. At the time, I think the, the good, le the good so level is BP, probably... BPI Europe? But there, there is a BPI, a European BPI. We work a lot with, uh, uh, with BOE and uh, uh, for European uh, uh, investment funds. So, uh, uh, and there are a lot of connection in what we do and, and we coordinate a lot on that. But uh, I think, uh, uh, of course, there is a lot of money in China and a lot of money in, in, in Europe. Uh, the point is that you don't create an ecosystem only with money, uh, even though we are fighting to get more resources uh, to, uh, uh, to finance startup and so on. You create an ecosystem because you, you get the skills you get the IP, the, the guys which are creating technology, especially in the deep tech, 
uh, uh, and, and when you look to any VC or any people which has met few uh, innovation projects, I've done that in my uh, uh, previous uh, uh, life, you, you know that the, one of the main problems is uh, human resources kills people that are leading the, the project. So uh, I think, of course, there is a question of money. Uh, there are needs to, to make change in, in this ecosystem, especially in the way you finance uh, uh, research. I think the uh, National Agency of Research is doing something maybe not the right way of what you want to do uh, because they are fi financing projects so there are probably new ideas to, uh, to transform and change but I think we need also to understand that the, the, the value will come also in the, uh, the skills uh, the way uh, we mix the different skills to create a project because having a very good uh, guy which is an expert in technology is, is very good but you need someone which make a, will make a business of that at the end of the game because maybe it can take 10 or 15 years but at the end of the game we need uh, uh, we need a business because we need something that will create value and in that the the, the problem we've got in France to be direct is that we are a very good engineer and we need to to, to uh, clearly invest more in that but we need also to have people which knows about making business about creating new markets making marketing business development, because that's the two of the link of those two skills that will mix some, something which will be very efficient in, in the medium and, and long term. And, uh, and I think we need to focus on the money. We need also to focus into uh, uh, leveraging th those skills. Sophia? Yeah, I, could, I, I totally agree with you. And I could add that uh, uh, in our network in, in France and in other countries, we have uh, understood quite early two years ago that we need certainly to have some hubs that we are naming uh, why we are innovation and we are recruiting new people in our hubs just to support startups because we understood that we need to help them understand what should be a business plan what should be uh, what the aim uh, how they should present things how to help them not only financing but really how to help them go forward and uh, let's say market their project because the project is something but then you should be sure that you are explaining to people what will be the impact of your project because you have to make people trust in you and this trust sometimes uh, when they are creative they just don't know how to explain it in the right way so a part of our business also is helping them supporting them in that that will help them also to gather financing, to gather equity, and then we will continue to help them grow. So as you said, uh, I think that skills are important, project is important, but more than that is how you explain what the project will be impacting uh, the society and the economy. Question for Evgenia or Emai, uh, about the values, because uh, this is, uh, some people said we are living in a very giant bubble. <laughs> with uh, the lot of money that I uh, spoke about, and uh, some values are completely incredible. So um, we, can, uh, we have all ideas about that, the Nasdaq, which is very expensive, and so on, the, the market, the, the stock market is very expensive everywhere, especially in the US. Uh, what, is, what is it about the deep tech company you, you are investing in? Does the, 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 do the value are very expensive also? Does, does it create a, uh, a scale effect, or no, uh, it is not, it, uh, it's not the case. I mean, I, I think, um, sorry, can I, can I just come back on, on, on something really quickly as well? Um, uh, sorry, valuations first. Well, it depends. I, I think in terms of um, values today, I think US is probably far, far away ahead of Europe in terms of having frothy uh, valuations, be it with the stock market or, or the private market. I think Europe still has a long way to go. Uh, simply because for a very long time we also didn't have a lot of capital. Uh, so in Europe, if you look at sort of Series B and beyond, I think there's 14 times less capital. So buy in, Europe it, and sell Silicon Valley, this is what you say. Buy Europe and sell Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, th th that comes back to a point I was going to uh, try and make is, is uh, beyond sort of 
flushing the ecosystem with money or advice, you also need to convince people to buy. So, and I'm ad addressing the corporates here is, um, you know, everyone seems to turn around and be like, well, Apple will buy me or Amazon will buy me or Google will buy me. We got to convince the corporates in the European ecosystem to start paying premiums uh, for, for the innovation, right? It's not just about creating an incubator or creating a, you know, a VC arm of a corporate. It's about a, um, finding budget holders within the corporates who can become clients, right? Because it's extremely hard for a young startup to go and sell into a corporate and then also convincing them to, to buy that innovation and pay the premium for it. Maybe uh, am I, and I have a question for you. But uh, yeah, no, stop. I think that valuations in deep tech are still relatively reasonable. You get into these bubbles in certain areas that get very hot. Robotics, maybe, is an example. Um, for us, I think with a smaller fund, I think there's a real opportunity in um, exits that are going to be of several hundred million dollars, but not take a lot of capital to get there in terms of the corporate acquisition pipeline, uh, at least in the states. I think is relatively robust. Um, I would say that the billion dollar funds, and there are more and more of them, are, are facing a challenge of, of competing for the, the unicorns that may be um, farther away in the deep tech ecosystem. Uh, my other question is, as you know, Peter Thiel, and as you know, the big investors in the Silicon Valley, what is completely uh, terrifying me, and I think people uh, all over the world, is that we have here trillion dollars companies. We have Google, Facebook, the GAFAs, uh, plus, plus uh, Microsoft is three, tr three trillion dollars of capitalization. How is it possible to compete? Is it possible to compete with these companies? Uh, I don't speak about the China, which is a, it's a state uh, uh, model, but uh, in, in these companies, they have the money to do what they want. They can buy all the best uh, brands in the world. They can uh, and they say they are going to uh, bring the market some new disruptions that we have no idea. Uh, so uh, how to do that? Plus the DARPA, uh, is, uh, it, is it possible to compete? <laughs> I think history is littered with giant companies that had their day. I mean, the, the, the actual numbers are bigger now, but the relative numbers no, may that's not... No, that's true. They are very, very giant to see. Okay. Okay. Right? Also. So I, I think there's always an But my question is about Silicon Valley. So in, in does the Silicon Valley is too powerful and uh, uh, we can't compete with what Google, Facebook, and so on are doing? Uh, I don't actually believe that. I, again, you know, powers rise and powers fall, and it's all about disruption. So I think there's, there's opportunities, and I think there's going to be pushback where uh, Silicon Valley is seen to be uh, too powerful. Okay. André, you're not uh, agreeing. Don't agree. It's right. I mean, there, there are cycles, but it's striking, and I don't know if everybody knows this very uh, well-known fact that out of the 10 largest companies in the world, uh, uh, eight are American, two are Chinese, and nine are tech companies. Zero are European. And the other thing is that since we live in a world where I think 90% of the ad uh, revenues, the advertising revenues, online advertising, go to two companies, Facebook and, uh, and Google, you have this double dip effect. That means these companies, because of their, 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 their almost monopolistic uh, platform capability, reinvest that money. Look what Jeff Bezos is doing in a space. Uh, you have Elon Musk who is using a DARPA program, Falcon rockets, in order to create SpaceX. But you have in parallel Jeff Bezos because of the money accumulated by Amazon who is able to create a complete space program which makes Ariane rocket, please don't quote me on that, probably worthless because they're completely disrupting it. So I agree with you, it might change, but uh, you know, Maybe the time will change. We are in Europe. We're going to be dead. <laughs> I, sorry, oh, can I can I disagree with that a little bit? Maybe maybe an optimistic view, but um, I don't to be think. That, <laughs> I don't think those guys can do everything. I mean, uh, if, uh, yes, sure, the large multi-billion, multi-trillion-dollar companies. But you know, if if we believed that this is the only place where innovation comes from, I might as well like, quit my job and <laughs> not do investing anymore. Um, th there will be other things, right? Like if you look at Europe, um, I think you know. 
uh, DeepMind is still one of the most exciting uh, deep tech companies, and it came from Europe. Uh, we have also over 40 unicorns today. We just had one of the largest funding rounds with improbable half a billion dollars that's also in Europe, right? There will be things that will, will come out of, out of the European market. Um, again, we have amazing research centers, amazing universities. People are starting to productize things earlier. So I think that things are bound to happen here. Like, they, they can't own possibly everything in the world, right? Okay, thank you all. Uh, do you have any questions in the public? We have two minutes to, to take a question. So I'm Christoph Potempa, founder of Brain Cures. And so we're a biotech that essentially ha knows how to make big data, smart data to prevent or accelerate treatments and diagnostics for brain diseases. And we know what serious problem it is and how big economically it is or the profits are. So we have talked in the last six months to many stakeholders and no one was interested in repurposing. So no one's interested in curing. And then uh, everyone that we talk on the VC side is just let's focus on exit. Well, I'm saying, well, let's focus on building a great product that's gonna become the next empire that you are talking about. And so the follow on question is, can VCs learn from charities like the Alzheimer Drug Discovery Foundation? Charities have made millions. I can, you probably know the examples yourselves. They have essentially used a model called research-backed obligations. Instead of saying, oh, I want the ROI of a thousand, say, look, let's, be, let's have a win-win deal. And that's, I think, the only way you can make great innovators work and make a difference for the world. Thank you. So, you open Thank you. to your comments. W wants to tell something? Maybe. I'm, I'm Thank not you very much. I'm not sure you can make VCs operate like charities. They're very different models, obviously. Um, but I think there are new models arising to support things like uh, drug development out of the charities. So if you look at the way um, if you look at the way foundations are operating now, they are also starting to invest yeah. and, and look for yeah. those win-win opportunities. So I think it's actually the, far, finance, the foundation world that's changing rather than the VC world. No, I think that's right. I think, unfortunately, you know, we have investors ourselves, so we have limited partners. So we have a fiduciary duty to them who then have fiduciary duty to pension plans and universities, right? So, but we unfortunately can't, can't operate like a charity. But, but I do think there is a concept of the triple bottom line, right? And there are opportunities that we'll invest in which will be both good for the world as well as create financial profit. Totally agree. I mean... The VC model relies on the LPs. The LPs have a goal. You can't change that. What you can do is go after different kind of investors that have different criteria for investing. It could be impact investing, charities, philanthropic foundations, whatever. But I don't think you can change the VC model. Thank you very much. Sophia, you want to say something? Well, also? I was just saying that... Last word. Yeah, charity foundation is also changing the way they are investing. So our they are, in a way, going through being sure that what they are doing will be investing in the right way with the right impact. So it's a way to answer to your question. Okay, that will be the last one. Thank you all for this very interesting debate.